Yeah. Hello, hello, hello. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, all right, all right. Good morning. How's everybody doing today? All right, good. Um, I'm Jared. I have been serving here for, uh, you know, it's been, been a time now that I've been a friend of Brad and, and a friend of Brennan and, and some of the amazing people here. Um, and now we've been working together to do some great things uh, at the end zone so that we could be a real, real light to the community. And this is my father. You can introduce yourself. Uh, I'm that guy that was up there. Uh, <laughs> I'm his dad, Daryl Green. <laughs> um, so, so most of the time when I meet someone who's a you know, big fan of you, we have to go through this process of like what their favorite play is and where, where they saw you when they were a kid and then you signed this autograph or didn't sign this autograph this one time. And so, um, and so let's just, I wanna get a lot of stuff out the way before we, before we go. Um, so I want to talk about what this means. Matter of fact, why don't we ask the people, what, what is this, what is this? Okay, Hall of Fame, all right. Who knows what year? he went into the Hall of Fame. Oh wait, man, that was quick. Okay. All right. Who knows what this jacket means? Top 100. Yes, you're right. All right. So which one is better? It's up to your debate. What, what, what would you say? Is, which one's better? Uh, well. <laughs> or is it like you got to have this to get to this? You can't have, well, you can't the, have the NFL like celebrated 100 years about two years ago, and they, they, they picked 100 of the greatest players, and so they had that. And, of course, the Hall of Fame is more a historic honor. So I think they're both pretty awesome. Um, I have some other show and tell with me, and how many, some of you old schoolers remembering the Redskins won the Super Bowl against Miami, 1982-83. Uh, I was in college. And then the, they came back when I came, and we, uh, we went 14-2, and two and we went to the Super Bowl, and we lost the Super Bowl, and I got an NFC championship ring. Then uh, after that, Doug Williams led us to the Super Bowl again, and uh, against, uh, who was it, against Denver in 87, 80, 88. Got another Super Bowl ring, and then Mark Rippon led us to the Super Bowl uh, in 2000, uh, I'm sorry, 91, 92. Got another Super Bowl ring. And then to go with that jacket, I got a Hall of Fame uh, ring as well so that's it for show and tell uh <clears throat> so and i need to i need to say two things for housekeeping purposes first and foremost this is a disclaimer the redskins are a former team and now they're called something else and blah, 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 blah. okay great uh yes. se <laughs> second thing my dad doesn't walk around with uh all that gold all the time <laughs> we brought it here for today it's normally in your sock drawer yeah okay uh, now you got to move it from your sock drawer if someone tries to break in your house we can move it to the underwear or, or to the shirts or something like that. Um, so now that we got that all out the way, I want us to be reminded of this really, really great passage that I think could like embody everything that we just said. We want to know what the Bible says about like all that, right? Because we're here for the Lord, right? So the Bible says this in Philippians 3 verse 8. It says, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. Rubbish meaning, you know. So all of this really doesn't have much meaning. Yeah, so the way, the way it works for me is um, I asked Jesus Christ to become the Lord, uh, come into my heart when I was in college. I was goody two-shoes. I was a nice kid, my, per my sister. <laughs> I'm the fifth of seven kids. She's the sixth. And she probably took a lot of pounding from me because I only had two under me and the other ones older than me. They pound me and I pound them. So, so but I was good at two shoes and she said that. But when I went to college, went to a Bible study and heard the gospel of Jesus Christ at goody two shoes. There ain't no goody two shoes. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I got on my knees and I said, God, I did not know that. I want to live for you. And so my perspective in coming into this world was one of gratitude to Jesus for dying on the cross for me and saving me. That said, 
as I've accumulated all these things, they really become what you have in your pocket, a key, a house key. They open doors, so they get us in, and then as I'm honored today to be with my son, we come in with this, but like everything else, we typically, we put these down, we put them away like you do with your keys, and then we share what's really most important, and that's what you're gonna hear today, uh, what's really most important. One thing that's very funny, and we said this last service, is that we never really talk football, and I really don't know as many stats as a lot of other people, um, and I don't really remember a lot of games, and really none of that stuff really mattered to me. Um, and so I appreciate people for coming up to me and saying, hey, your dad you know, had this interception in this game, and I'm like, oh, that's so awesome. And I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about, but I, I get it, it was great to you. But um, tell us a little bit about how you balance the notoriety and the fame, but then at the same time being a regular human being. You know, it's interesting, uh, let, me, let him say that again, what he just said. It's weird to some people that literally in all those years in our house, I think he was maybe 14 when I retired, we never talked about football. We never, the game, I came home, we never said, hey, what about this? And it's like, it hit me when we talked about it before, like, yeah, we never did. We never did talk about football. We never did. Uh, we didn't uh, in the morning. I'm eating my cereal, and I go, Dad, what did you, like, yeah, tell me about happened? the best time that? that you had yeah. year 1990. And we never whatever. did it. Yeah. Never talked about it. Um, oh, oh, and tell them about um, the, uh, the babysitter story. Oh, so when the babysitter, you know, we would leave them with the babysitters before the game back at RLK Stadium back in the early days, and... Uh, uh, so one day I was just walking out the door and I said, oh, by the way, the game's on Channel 5. And then uh, I guess I would probably say that a lot. And then eventually one day the, the, the girl kind of came up to me kind of squeamishly like, uh, Mr. Green, uh, your kids don't watch the game. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, oh, I mean, it was, it was like, okay, it's no big deal. I just thought they watched the game and the reality is they didn't watch the game, and then I think how they got introduced to the fact that I played was that as you got a little bit older, some of the kids were talking about the game, and you didn't know about the game, and they said, man, your dad did, this, this guy pushed your dad down or whatever, and now I think if anything, that would be the only thing that made Jared kind of like, okay, I gotta, gotta get some understanding because these kids are talking about my dad at school and I don't even know anything about it. That did make it difficult, you know, because if when your teacher brings up <clears throat> something about what happened on the Monday night game and, and it's you Tuesday have no morning, clue. you don't know, and then you're just nodding like, I'm just trying to get a good grade. I'm just here, <laughs> I'm just here for school. Um, so then I would say like, hey dad, what, what happened last yeah, night? Okay, yeah. cool, I'll know to bring that up. Or, or yeah. if someone asks me, I know what to say. Um, and the reason why, why we're telling you these stories, the true stories about how we grew up is because I think it's important for us all to understand who the true hero is. And you know, if you wanna give a title to this talk, it's I'm not your hero. So I think a lot of times, especially in the world that we live in, we, we live in a consumer-based society. So all you're supposed to do is celebrate something and, and like give yourself to something and, and basically just kind of, you know, put something on a pedestal. And so our goal today is to kind of, kind of poke at that idolatry, you know, <laughs> because that's what it is. Um, and, and really lead people to seeing God as the king. Now does, that does not mean two things we have to say. That does not mean <laughs> that we can't celebrate what God has done. So you can say, wow, look what God has done in your life that you've been able to play in these Super Bowls, you've been able to go to the highest levels. But it should start with God gave you the opportunity. And it's not cliche, it's, it's an important thing for you to think. And then obviously for your own life, for you to say, wow, I've gotten two promotions in, in one year. Look at what God is doing. So if you start to think that way, then you always glorify God opposed to glorifying yourself or glorifying man. If you don't clap, just nod can we get an amen something and also uh, i would like to say after the service please don't just run out of here if you want to come and say hello please do and if you have a jersey on please do 
this is he Jesus. Say, he's saying that because where we're about to go, you're going to think that we don't want you to ever <laughs> celebrate anything about him. So, I get, <laughs> so don't run. I'm going to chase yeah. you down. Uh, <laughs> uh, I can still outrun all of y'all. <laughs> I'm 62 years old and I know I can. Yeah. So I want to share this other thing that's important before we get into the scripture. Um, because sometimes we talk about how, like for me as a son, people tell me about your stats and I always say, man, that's really cool. But what you did know is he's never cheated on my mom. You know, what you did know is he, he, he doesn't yeah. really do much, you know, in, in, in the world. Um, you've never seen him on papers. Like that we, it wasn't difficult for Brett to, to, to say we can have the mic without Brett being up here. Like this isn't a controversial figure where you guys had to say, I don't know, they're bringing Daryl Green to church. I don't know about this church. <laughs> like it, 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 there's a lot of guys that would, you'd think that if we brought them up here, you don't think that. So yes, you are a little bit of a goody two shoes. So, um, so, so I want us to really, you know, focus on the fact that though you're not a hero, you are actually pretty good, or you were pretty good at what you did. Sometimes people think because you're a believer and because you shift your focus off of the thing that you do to glorify God, that you're not, all, you're not good at what you do. So if someone was trying to run a route against you in 1995, um, a great thing, a great story is like when you broke Michael Irvin's nose. Yeah. It's like, I still will, I still will, <laughs> don't clap about that. <laughs> Yeah, because we might send this to him and then he's going to be like, oh, man. Yeah. Um, but but you still are able to do your job at the highest level and to, as your older brother has always told me, take no prisoners on the field. Um, so tell us about the dynamics of yeah. still being excellent and and, you know, crushing the game. That's a, I think that's we all struggle with that. We really are the keepers of the land as Christians. In this country, whatever good or bad it is, it's, it's all on us. The Bible says the judgment will begin right here with us. It won't be with them. Oh, you don't know people over there. No, no, it's going to be the people of God. But it's super important that we learn to recognize what God has given us and has given everybody. He said he'd give gifts to men, different unique gifts. He doesn't say he Men's to run fast, but those are included. You know, he talks about it in a spiritual sense. But for me, understanding that I, I guess, I don't know, maybe I was in college, I realized, man, oh man, I am fast. I can run, I can outrun all of these guys. And I, I understood that. I knew that I could do that. I knew I could cover receivers. I knew I was good at what I could do. But my salvation was always going to be first and foremost. And so, it's, a, it's, it's how do you walk through that, that aspect of your life? How do you, some of y'all are uh, Hall of Famers in what you do. They, everybody just don't know it because it's not on TV, but she's a baller, he's a baller. Everybody is great in something that they do. Sometimes you don't have, you don't, number one, you don't have the ability or you don't have the consciousness to use that key for the glory of God. Some of you are dropping the ball every day. Because if you're influenced at your job, uh, I'll digress for a second and say that Joe Gibbs, and I'll just say this, it's not, I don't think it's embarrassing, but Joe Gibbs is 80 years old, I believe. He's, some of y'all remember Joe Gibbs, right? <clears throat> Joe Gibbs said to me uh, several months ago uh, uh, that uh, he wanted to go and reach out to all of the players and coaches he's ever been with and tell them about Jesus Christ. And I asked him to do that when he was playing. I, said, I asked, I said, Coach, why don't you be more, for lack of a better word, boisterous in your presentation of the gospel? And, he, and his philosophy was, man, I'm the head coach and I don't want to create. And then he comes back now 30 years later saying, I want to get everybody. And I want to do a video. And he was going to come to Redskin Park and capture it in front of the trophies. And I don't know if he ever did it, but he said at 80 years old, I want to tell everybody, because, because one of our teammates passed away and it kind of triggered him. He said, man, I didn't tell them about Jesus Christ. So all of you, I've tried to tell them about Jesus Christ because they put mics in my face and I get to go to, I got my keys, I go to schools, I can do all these different things. And what about you? 
Are you taking your little key? Your key just opens a mailbox, mine opens a mansion. But they're both keys and they're both significant. So it's important for us all to be responsible for the, for the we are to subdue the earth and multiply and, and share the gospel. As you said earlier at the, at the Hall of Fame, I said, what did I say? Loving, knowing God, loving God, and making God known. And that's what I get to do. That's why I said, what was the quote that I said at the Hall of Fame? Anybody remember it? That was, said, I said, I belong here. I belong in the Hall of Fame. Why? Because I know what to do with these keys. And so everybody need to ask themselves, what are you doing with yours? Are you sharing the gospel? You're the senior class president. You're the starter on the football team. I see young people in here. You're the parent. You're the oldest child. You're the oldest, I'm not talking about just children, but you're the oldest daughter in the family and you're 50. Uh, whatever you are, you, where's your influence and how are you expanding the kingdom and advancing the kingdom of God in your life? I'm trying to do the best I can with mine. And so that's important. I, I went way down a different road, but it's fine. So we're just sitting in chairs, just talking to um, <laughs> So uh, if you have a Bible, uh, which most likely you don't, but if you have a phone or a tablet or if you're a robot, <laughs> Uh, go to Acts chapter 14, 8 through 18. We're going to basically contrast the experience that we're having here with what, what I would call a person of prominence and the life of Paul, Paul the Apostle. And so we just celebrated Resurrection Sunday. And after Resurrection Sunday, Christ returned and he, and he appeared and he, before ascending into heaven, he said, hey, I'm going to give you this power. He said that in Acts 1.8. And that power is basically going to do many things, but the most important thing is to, to advance the kingdom. Like, let people know who God is and that he's real and that you would ultimately usher people into a relationship with God by using that power. So you fast forward, Paul gets knocked off the horse, road to Damascus, gets transformed by the gospel, ends up preaching the gospel. And so this is one moment in Lystra where Paul is preaching. And in verse eight, it says that a man was sitting who had no strength in his feet. And basically the man was lame, you know, from, his, from, from the time he was born and he never walked. This man was listening to Paul while Paul was speaking. So just like now, if I'm speaking in front of you all and there's somebody in here who needs healing, um, and they're, they're, you know, maybe it's that they're on crutches or that they're sitting on the ground. And so as I'm talking, this person is acknowledging what I'm saying, but it says that, that while listening to Paul, Paul had fixed his gaze on this man. And Paul saw that he had faith to be healed. So it's amazing. Paul's sitting in the middle of this sermon trying to lead people to Christ. But at the same time of preaching the gospel, he's aware and acknowledging that there's somebody who's hurting. And he's also aware of the power of God that he has access to. So we'll keep on reading. It says that he had seen that he had faith to be made well. And he said on a, with a loud voice, stand upright on your feet. And he leaped up and began to walk. So a miracle happens. I mean, a lot of times we read the Bible like it's just some like dull book. You're like, oh yeah, okay. Then the guy got healed. All right, next, next verse. <laughs> like, no, let's stop for a second. If we're speaking right now and I go, yeah, so dad, tell me about your Hall of Fame career. Wait a second, that person can't walk. Hey, get up and walk. And then they walk. And everyone knows that that person has been lame for a long time. You would not want to hear anything that he has to say for the rest of the time, right? You'd be like, what is going on? They just healed a guy. Um, and so then it says that the crowd saw Paul, what Paul had done, and they raised their voice saying, uh, the thing just switched, so I've got to, <laughs> I lost my spot. Uh, okay, they saw, and they said, the gods have become like men and have come down to us. And they began calling Barnabas Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was uh, the, the chief speaker. So the priests of Zeus, uh, whose temple was just outside the city, they basically went out and got a bunch of stuff and came back to present it to Paul to like put sacrifice together because they thought Paul was a god, Paul was a deity. So the moral of the story is, there's, there's kind of three lessons here. One is Paul, who's called by God, if you are a believer, you're called by God to be a witness. In other words, to minister. Ministry is not a profession. People, people do it as a profession, but ministry is just the service to people. 
we're all called to serve people. If That's you it. love God, you should love people. So the one thing is Paul is called to do ministry and he's ministering. Second thing is he's aware and mindful of a lame man and, and, he, and he, he asked God to heal him. Not even asked God, he just, in the name of God, uh, declared that someone be healed. Then the third part is the reaction. So it says when the crowd, when the crowd saw what, it, what he had done, they lost their minds. And then they go back in the, the temple of Zeus and all that stuff. They come back and they start idolizing Paul, uh, laying stuff at his feet, sacrificing animals. It's just getting real weird up in there. And, and then Paul responds by ripping his clothes with anguish, gnashing his teeth, weeping and saying, what are you doing? I am a man of the same nature as you. And it's funny, as we, as we look at that passage, we, I look at your life and how people see what you do and then they idolize you. And now it's so acceptable in America to idolize someone that we even have shows called Idol, like American Idol. Um, I've had so many people come to me in my life, especially in this area, and they say, man, your dad's my idol. I'm like, okay, you need to get saved. <laughs> like, that's my response. Like, if, that, if he's your idol, he can't get you into heaven. Like, you better find, so he doesn't have a heaven to put you in. So, um, we, wanna, we wanna really like dissect this passage and kind of do some contrast with your life and, and with what happened here. So first, looking at verses eight through 10 and understanding the awareness. How have you been able to be aware of who you are to people but then also aware of the pain and the hurting that other people have. Tell us a little bit about your time when you first came to DC and how you had this transition of thought. I was so glad that I got saved in college before I came to this, because this, I could see how this could just destroy people and it does. Um, so I've lived my entire life, 62 years old now, but from time of college, I have a very sober and with gratitude for my salvation. Uh, I came from a broken home and all that stuff and and I've seen a lot of bad stuff but man I got saved. He changed my life and I wasn't a famous football player. Uh, matter of fact I started football in 11th grade on the junior varsity about 150 pounds and walked on to college, dropped out of college, went back to college in a year and a half later and I got drafted in the first round. So I didn't even plan to be a pro football player but my salvation was first and foremost. I was so glad I saw Joe Gibbs pray on TV, this the Lord's Prayer, after they won that Super Bowl the year before I got here. And I really wanted to come and play here because I thought this team was a Christian team just because they prayed. Show you how naive I was. <laughs> but so I've never forgotten that. And when I was 10, I had a dream. I had a vision what I wanted to be in life. I knew what I wanted to be from the time I was 10, I'm telling you. Uh, it was a day my mom picked us up from the elementary school and I went to the car and about three kids of the seven kids were in the car and I said, hey, where y'all going? And somebody said, we're leaving dad. In that moment, I said, when I get to be a dad and a husband, I'm gonna be the greatest husband in the world. And you know what I get to do? I've done a lot of doing. I was a truck driver, a pro football player. I did a lot of things. But what I wanted to be was I wanted to be the most incredible husband and the most incredible dad in the world when I was 10 years old. That's what I wanted to be. And the great thing about it is, I don't ever have to retire. I'll literally die as the greatest husband and greatest dad, period. You don't have to retire. Anything that I do, all these things that I do and will do and have done, it's a million things I'll do. And unfortunately, the world is kind of driven by that. That said, I, I started the Youth Life Learning Centers in Washington, D.C. to try to help kids because of who God, what God had done in my life. And so I, and I stayed faithful to my wife. I loved my kids. I worked as hard as I can. You know I never went to another team. Anybody think about, thought about that? I was on strike. Y'all never even asked the question. Why didn't Daryl go to another team? Because God told me not to. Because Break that down. Tell them the whole part of that. <clears throat> so the team was going to get rid of me. Uh, I'm not going to say why they was. I'm not sure why they would do that. But they said, we're going to tear up your contract, go find a team. Well, goodness, I'm only about four or five years in the league. I'm going to find a team. So sure enough, the team was ready to bring me and give them first round picks. I'm going to Denver. And, and here it is. The money is there. They're going to pay me a lot of money. And I went into my basement. I said, God, everything is set. But what do you say? He said, don't do it. 
So basically, I was going to be done with my career. They said, we don't want you. And you said, and I can't, God said, I can't go. So ultimately, uh, I ended up signing a contract for way less than I would make. And I never, ever had a conversation with a, another team ever again. And you know what else? I never got fired. I quit. I quit when I was 42, almost 43 years old, when they wanted me to continue to play. So God is faithful. He's a gracious and faithful God. But to your point, my goal was to follow God's word and desires. I had no idea I was going to be Daryl Green. That was not in the deal. I did not know that. I had no idea. And so you don't know what you're going to do. But if you are deciding to be the man and woman of God that God has called you to be and be a representative of him in the earth, dude, you don't know what God would do in your life and through your life. But so with the foundation, it was because I was going to D.C. serving kids and ultimately I was driving home one night after an event and I just started crying. And God just spoke to me and said, Daryl, you're a nice guy. and You've been out here all these all these weeks and months. But man, there's really no real effect. You signed autographs, people saw you, they gave out gifts and punch and cookies, but that's really nothing. And then that's how I started my own work uh, to reach out to the next generation myself with the gospel, with academics, with social services and all the rest, but most of all, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's been my motivation. Oh, and by the way, I play pro football for the Washington Redskins. And so I think that's been the way I've lived. And I think we said this before. We, we said it earlier that it, it was weird that we didn't talk about football because you think that was such a big deal of our lives. It wasn't. It was my job and I was good at it. But I'm, a, I'm an awesome husband. I'm an awesome dad. I'm an awesome community servant. And I, want, and I want to love Jesus Christ. And it really gets to be kind of that simple. And I think people can complicate it. And if you are famous... I, I'm trying to write this book called The, the Paradoxical Journey. And the unique paradox is I meet people all the time. Hey, how you doing, man? I'm Daryl. Man, you're Daryl Green. Well, the reality is I'm Daryl. And the reality is I'm Daryl Green. And how do I walk through that paradox of these two realities between us two? And part of that, as you talk about, uh, that asked me about was that in that book, there's something called the EHHCS, Excessive human to human celebration syndrome is what killed people, I think, humbly, like Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson and these guys, the Beatles and different, they were celebrated from the time they were born. And human beings, unfortunately, we're not physiologically, psychologically, sociologically, we're not created to be worshipped. We're just not, we're not, we're not even made that way. But then when we get worshiped and we jack up, then you look at us and say, man, he's jacked up. Well, you kind of helped jack him up because he didn't have Jesus and you worshiped him and he just ain't made for that. And guess what? That's why he cheated on his wife and left his wife and did this and did that. And he's an alcoholic because he just can't. I'm not God. I'm not God. I'm not God. And we keep saying you are God. And without Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ in your soul, in your life, it can kill you. And so for all of us, all of us, because all of us deal with excessive human to human celebration syndrome. We all, uh, uh, we all have the drum major, Dr. King said that, we all have the drum major instinct. We all think we're something. The scripture says, see yourself, see others as better than yourself. And so it's a unique paradox that we all live in, all of us. We're just utilizing it and we can go around the country ministering the gospel with the use of this, but all of us are that way. All of us, because we are also, because of our fallen nature, we're kind of looking for it too. We want to bring it on, bring it on, bring it on. Come on, bring it on. We all want it. We all want it. We all have the drum major instinct. We want to be first and out there. We want to be, but it's only one that should. And you know who should lead that charge in celebrating him? The people of God, us. Boy, I went another down no, the road. I, this is good. I mean, there's no rules here. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is good. I think, I think to, to sum up that last point about the way Paul did what he did, I think the reason why Paul was so aware, Paul was a very self-aware person. If you read his letters, he's like very, very in tune with where he's at in life. And I think there's two reasons why. I think number one 
is because he knew what he came from. That's it. Number he one. Knew it, That's like, it. I was not what I was supposed to no. be, and God transformed my life. And maybe what it is is, because one thing we left out of what you just said is, when you had that revelation and when you broke down crying and you were saying, you had said before, I wasn't living in my purpose. I wasn't doing what God called me to do. You guys were Super Bowl champions. So everybody was saying, you're doing everything great. Yeah. And you were internally saying, I'm not doing what God made me to do. Just to make that very clear. So one night I was coming home from one of the events in D.C., driving down GW Parkway, and I just started crying. I just heard God saying, Daryl, what's going on? Like, hey, God, yeah, man, we just left this event, man, with these kids. And I, and I just heard God say, Daryl, that's great. And I realized exactly what you're saying. Man, I'm not, I'm not really walking out what God has called me to. I'm just being a famous player, going over here and doing a few things. But the Holy Spirit really began to speak to me. And it causes you to put yourself realigned with God. It's a realignment with God to operate inside of his purposes. The Bible says that David carried out the purpose of God in his generation, then he died. These light bulbs may be 70 watts, 1,500 hours. And I always used to say to people, if you're not carrying out the purpose of God in this your generation, it's not a big deal, just don't die. <laughs> just don't die. Because before you die, you need to be, make sure that you have fulfilled the purpose of God if those light bulbs don't illuminate this room at the wattage and the time they were created to, then they have not done their job. And the same goes for us. I don't care who you are and how famous and what you have. If you have a fulfilled the purpose for which you were on it, the sun just sits there. It's passively sitting there doing what it was created to do. The moon is just sitting there. We get to participate with the Holy Spirit. We have a will, free will, and a responsibility, or uh, an opportunity to respond and participate with God, you better do it. That's really good. And I like that you use two light sources. <laughs> we need to be a light. Um, and, and really, when you think about Paul, not only him knowing his story, but also he was radically chasing after God and operating in his purpose. Mm. And so even that's the only way you can go to jail that many times and still be sane. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because the prisons that he was in are much, I mean, we got bad prisons in America. Don't get me wrong. Don't get me started on that either. But what he was going through was, was awful. And for him to say, oh, okay, well, I guess I'm going to be in here for a few weeks. Let me write a few passages. <laughs> like, let me write a few uh, uh, letters. So really phenomenal to be aware of who you are and then to be aware of your calling and then ultimately to be aware of God's purpose of, for your life. So that's how Paul was able during the middle of a sermon, in the middle of preaching, to say, I know that God heals people, and I know that this man is longing. He's seeking God. Let's do a miracle right now, God. Like, please show up. Mm. And so then the miracle happens. Now, what I want to talk about now is attraction. So um, I just really think that it's, it's so weird how uh, we're not cognizant of our worship. Like a lot of times we're worshiping and you don't know that you worship. And then if they use the term worship, then you're like, I'm not worshiping. I'm just celebrating this person. It's like, okay, well, Sunday morning, praise God. Go to the concert. Yeah. Your favorite football team scores. Yeah. It's like, eh, same move. You kind of doing move. the same move. Maybe you change the move up. Like, <laughs> you know, um, so naturally, and I figured, Y'all not feeling that. I figured it'd be quiet. So, yeah, yeah, wait a minute. Hold like, up now. Hey, look, I want to put my hands up. Put when that guy hit up. that three-pointer, go. <laughs> <laughs> Worship was, God. Hallelujah. I was at the Final Four uh, uh, two weeks ago, whatever the Final Four was. And, and um, I didn't go to the, the, the game on Monday because I just wanted to go back home. But, but the game before that game was UNC versus Duke. And it was just electric in there. Everybody's going crazy. And... Um, I just, every five seconds, everybody stood up and they put their hands up. And I just like, man, this is just weird. So I just stayed sitting back. Like, I like to sit down. I, actually, when they said that we had these chairs, I was pretty excited. So I like, to, <laughs> I like to sit down and enjoy the moment. I like to be present and be mindful and just be aware. And so I'm just watching the game. And so the guy next to me is like, man, are you not, are you not feeling this? I was like, no, I'm feeling this probably more than a lot of people. I'm just not about to stand up and put my hands up. I'll leave that for God. So um, you can be weird. Like, so what? Maybe that, maybe that guy felt like, oh, man, I wonder, 
like how I should figure out how I worship God. And, and it's not saying that putting your hands up is worship because uh, you can put your hands up for a lot, a lot of reasons or you can wave them like you just don't care. But I, <laughs> I'm saying that we are de- designed to worship. Naturally, you're designed to worship. And we're also designed to devote ourselves to things like this. So when you, when you are constantly picking up your phone, celebrating or worshiping information or, or the, the need for information, you're constantly uh, seeking information. You, you got all your uh, apps up, you've got ESPN ticker, you got, I mean, just so much information is coming into your brain at one point. Oftentimes you can miss out on what you're supposed to do. And so I, a lot of times you can be around someone like you and say, man, you're so amazing. And, and like, a great question I know that you're not a jerk so you wouldn't say this but you would say hey what are you doing you know and it's like well I don't, I don't know I mean you know because like we love to celebrate what we're not you know we're like oh man that play that you did that game that you played that thing that you did and it's like hey were you late for work yesterday yeah I was late but I mean it's about you Daryl you know or or like I didn't I didn't submit my sheets and my, my whatever I was supposed to turn in on Friday but I mean I'm here to watch Tom Brady tonight, you know, like, it's like, man, what about what you're supposed to do? God gave you talents, God gave you gifts, and God gave you keys, like you said, and so there's this weird attraction. So we get into the scripture where Paul does this miracle, and then the people go berserk. They start worshiping him uh, immediately, and they start calling him Zeus and Hermes, and I don't think that that's far off from where we are today. Like if one person does something special, we automatically just start worshiping and celebrating them. We don't call it worship because we're too religious to call it worship, but we are worshiping. And what, what I want to talk about is how miracles often demand something from us. Like we, we, we're going to give. If someone came up on stage, if Brennan came up on stage today and, and you know, wanted to talk about the miraculous uh, healing that he had from, from cancer then we would automatically have an emotional connection to him and want to make his life better. You, f- you feel what I'm saying? You, you hear someone go through something, there's a miracle, and then you're like, I want to give to what they're doing. I want to support that person, or I want to just know that person. We naturally want to give when we see a miracle. And so when something like that, you know, people are like, oh, you're doing the Daryl Green Youth Life Foundation and Learning Centers? I want to support. Or I want to give money. So it's a good thing. Miracles compel you to give. But let's give to God. They, they automatically diverted their, their worship. Idolatry is just redirected worship to the wrong object, not to the creator. Um, really, it was about, can we say at this moment, whoa, God moved through Paul and healed this man? Can we say right now, whoa, God used Daryl Green to do all this stuff so that he could advance the kingdom? Thousands of people going to college through his, through his nonprofit. Thousands of people getting saved through him preaching across the world. All of these great things have happened because of football. And I think that's the way I've been raised and the way I think. So I minimize this a lot because I maximize the ultimate purpose. He works everything together for the good of those who who love him and are called according to his purposes. So this is extremely insignificant unless you preach the gospel and use this as a gift. Does that make sense? Y'all agree with that? that? So because of the miracle, there came anguish. Can you imagine you doing something special? Let, let's, just, let's just put yourself in his shoes right quick. Let's say you, you, you win a sales you know, opportunity for your job, or let's say that you, know, you do something special in your, in your workplace or in the community, or you sing a, a solo, whatever it is, you do something phenomenal. And people come up to you and they go, you're Zeus. You'd be like, whoa, 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 this is weird. Paul ripped his clothes, threw dirt on his face. Like, <laughs> I, I want you to see that I hate this moment really like a lot right now so that you don't think that I love what you're doing. The crazy thing is we never get to experience that. Like you can't go to a restaurant without, that used to really bother me. Like we can't even eat. But you, you couldn't go to a restaurant without someone being like, this is what they do. Watch this, watch this. <laughs> Sorry to bother you. That is, that is. I don't want to interrupt, but my son has been a fan <laughs> for two and a half years. 
He was born in 2000. <laughs> and he's just so excited to meet you. And then, and then this is my favorite part. Y'all ready for this? They go, uh, I'm sitting over there, right? They go, can you take a picture with him? Okay, let me get in the picture. Jared, can, can you take a <laughs> Now I put my burger down like, I'm like, I just became a cameraman. That's the world that we live in. Yeah. This, that's Red Robin down the street. Like, you go to Red Robin, like, all right, here we go. And, I, and, and we said this before, and this is funny. I didn't know that you used to see those people doing yeah. that. I was always the one that was like, oh, boy, I, like, I see that stare. <laughs> that guy on table eight, he's coming. He's coming. Yeah. I was always conscious of that. I already know who's coming. But I also had created a plan. Either I'm going to do it today or I'm not. Say, hey, guys, I'm not doing anything. I'm with my family. Boom, boom, boom. If you guys are here when we finish, I'll do it. And about other times, hey, oh, yeah, bring him on. So, but I determine that. I determine that on your behalf, on my behalf. <laughs> yeah. Paul, Paul says this after all the anguish and ripping his clothes. He says, don't you know that we are men of the same nature? This is the same nature. Everybody here is of the same nature. We are all human beings. And Paul was like, man, if you guys missed this, you missed the whole point while I, was, while I was preaching. And the whole point of the miracle was that there's a different nature. Mm. There's a supernatural. There we go. And that force is coming from God Almighty who created. And then, and then he, he goes in and says this. He says, he says, preach, uh, uh, he says, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In the generations gone by, he permitted all the nations to go their own ways, yet he did not leave himself without witness. In other words, the God that made all of this stuff, the wind, the waves, the sea, the birds, fit, everything, all of this, and he gave you a witness. Like even in all of his glory, he revealed himself through the prophets, through the teachers, through the leaders, through, through, the, through the, um, the elders of what they were doing in their time in Acts. He continues to give you a witness to show you, hey, I'm God. Like, don't forget about me. And then this is the craziest part. At the end, it says this, last verse. Even saying these things with difficulty, they restrain the crowds from offering sacrifices. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Like, after he says all this, they're like, that's really cool. Hey, about the sacrifice, <laughs> like, you're still amazing. And so um, I would love to just have some fun as we close. Uh, <laughs> How do you deal with that? Like, there's a lot of, it's just kind of strange. I think it's the same thing that I'm, <laughs> it's, the same, it's the same thing that I'm hoping that all of us will do, that we will all learn to, to make Jesus Lord. He's not just Savior, he's Lord. I'm not talking about the, the pastors making him, but each one of us who love Jesus Christ, when you go to work, when you go home in the neighborhood, Let's each one of us be conscious, and conscious by the Holy Spirit, be, you know, seek the Spirit of God so that we can actually be beneficial in the earth. The worst thing, you know, I remember my dad was an alcoholic. I used to think, man, God, my dad got his butt whooped on earth. Didn't have a father. People mistreated him. White people mistreated him. This is per him. All this stuff happened. And I said, God, please. Let him come to know you so that he doesn't just get his butt kicked for eternity. And we led him to the Lord. And so, and, and so thank God. <clears throat> but I just say that to everybody, that all of us learn to, like Paul, to anguishly fight against everything. Racism, hate, sin, issues, what you, what's on the phone, all this evil that is coming against us, let's bow up and, and buck up and fight against it and not be afraid to, to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. You want the world to change, then he can change it through you. It's not gonna, now he said the rocks will cry out and worship him if you don't do it. I don't want no rock to take my place. Not only just worshiping, worshiping him, but advancing the kingdom for him. So that's the message today. What about you? Where is your inner Daryl Green? <laughs> <laughs> you look like, I'm Daryl Green too. <laughs> you know, and, and last thing I want to say is we have to get off here. Uh, don't run out of here. I want to say hello to you before you leave. The so reason, why, the reason why I kept saying this is because I went pretty hard at the first service. And I just talked about how I can't stand when people come up in front. So no one came up. 
I didn't mean you all. I mean those people, the other people. <laughs> but to sum this all up, the, the scripture says um, in Romans 2, verse 11, it says, God is not a respecter of persons. So when, when you get, you know, into the kingdom, God's not going to say, you know, I know I raised Lazarus. I know I've turned water to wine, but man, that I'm gonna have on all my rings when I walk in there. Like, that forty yard What up, Lord? <laughs> it's like he's not gonna say that. Um, and and we also know that he says he shares his glory with nobody. So every time that you try to give him or anybody that glory, he, he those who are righteous and, and those who love the Lord are going to just take that same stuff and just push it back towards him. You're never going to get, you know, I, people all my life, they're like, your dad never really like fully embraces. I'm like, you're not going to get it. You're not going to get it. He's, he's not going to give you what you want. You want him to say, when you say, remember when you guys were in that game, you want him to say, yes, I remember. It was amazing. Like, he's not going to give that to you. He, he's going to say, oh yeah, that was cool. I remember that. Um, because it's all for the glory of God. So that's it for our time. Any, any last thing? No, I appreciate you guys coming out. Did, did anybody, do, do y'all hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying? Really do. Give God the glory for that. Because I'm, I'm not out here, I'm not out here for pay. I'm not out here for be celebrated. I'm not, we're out here to advance the kingdom of God through Jesus Christ, period. Amen. That's Amen. it. Amen. All right, let's pray. <clears throat> Father God, we thank you for your goodness, for your grace. Thank you for your mercy and all that you've done um, in my father's life. Um, we ask that, um, that you would just move on our hearts today. Lord, that you would reveal yourself, that we would not be focused on the things around us, i.e. the news, our phone, social media, all those things, but we would really be fixed on you, Christ. Lord, we ask that you would forgive us for the excessive human to human celebration. And you would help us to know that people like my father are not our hero, you are our hero. Help us to leave this place loving you and seeking you more than we did before we came in your mighty name, amen. Amen.